Good morning or good afternoon, depending from where are you joining us. I would like to thank and uh, welcome all of you for participating in this webinar organized by ILC Dover. ILC Dover is a worldwide leader in the design and manufacturing of engineered flexible protective solutions for critical applications from aerospace to pharmaceutical industries. My name is Paulo, and it's a big pleasure for me uh, to host this session today where we will talk about flexible isolator technology containment that works in pharmaceutical processing. The pharmaceutical industry has been challenged across the years with the processing of dangerous substances, for example, hormones, steroids, anthracyclines, or any other cytotoxic materials. Nowadays, processing products with OELs on the nanogram range uh, is very common, and uh, the manufacturing of the ADCs is one of these examples. Adding to that, pharmaceutical plants are asked uh, to, to produce more products at the same location and using the same process equipment in shared facilities, which bring a huge challenge in terms of cleaning and cross-contamination. The speaker today will be Scott Patterson, Vice President of Pharma and Biopharma Technical Support. Scott has been with ILC Dover uh, over 14 years and leading innovative advancements to the pharma and biopharma industries using single-use containment technology. We will have the pleasure to have with us today David Aus, Product and New Business Development Manager. David has a large background in powder ending and will talk how uh, to mitigate risk on flexible isolators using the unique ArmorFlex Atmospheric Control Module. But before starting, I would like to inform if you may need some uh, uh, help or ask some questions during the presentation, please type it on the box and click Submit. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we will try to address all uh, of your questions. So uh, now, welcome, Scott, and talk to us about this technology. Uh, thank you, Paolo, and thank you for all of our guests that are attending today. Uh, just a quick note on connectivity, as we all may be challenged with, with broadband width. Um, if uh, we disconnect for any reason, uh, stay tuned. We'll, we'll reconnect quickly. If you lose connection, just please log back on. Uh, today's program... Uh, we'll uh, cover a range of subjects uh, with flexible isolators and the single-use concept. Uh, we'll begin with the materials of construction and some of the design and manufacturing techniques that are used. We'll go through a variety of applications in pharmaceutical processing um, and show real-time uh, solutions that have been installed and proven. Uh, Dave Howells, again, will join us and go through the benefits of the negative pressure control system and how that influences uh, the performance of flexible containment. Uh, then we'll look at uh, the risk assessment process and actual case studies for performance data, followed by uh, really the cost benefits and project management when doing a flexible isolator project. So beginning with flexible isolators and the single use concept. Uh, isolators are used for high containment into the nanogram level and single use isolators are meant to eliminate costly cleaning and validation processes. So with that, we have to ask, what is the problem in pharma processing we are solving with this technology? And really, using flexible isolators, we can apply high containment solutions to any process while making it economically feasible. And I think that's really the basis of it is to look at both the technical solution and then to make the containment economical. So just a, a note on single use and, and a question that often comes up uh, is uh, single use meaning that it can only be used one time and, and then it must be disposed of. But the single use isolators are robust and meant or could be used for multiple use uh, while still maintaining risk elimination. We're showing a quick example here of a simple flexible isolator that was used in an oral contraceptive tablet inspection process. So of course, during tablet inspection, uh, the materials are destroyed, and so it's, it's not product that's going to be sold. So in this case, many campaigns over many months could be processed in using the same flexible isolator. So again, the, the idea of single use is not a discussion about the robustness of the isolator, but really goes to 
uh, the cleaning requirements and when does a isolator need to be cleaned. Here we'll see the benefits of disposal versus going through that cleaning and validation process. And that'll be an underlying theme for the presentation today. So we start when we look at flexible isolators, really a design philosophy that's across containment, uh, the, the containment technology market overall, and that's really contain at the source. Uh, when we contain at the source, we reduce, uh, we reduce the reliance on personal protective equipment, which again, when we look here at the hierarchy of controls, uh, commonly uh, published by uh, regulatory bodies like NIOSH, using PPE, is considered to be the least effective method. So we're trying to reduce that reliance on PPE and go with an engineering control as stated in the hierarchy to isolate people from the hazard. So if we eliminate or reduce contamination, uh, we, we keep that process room clean. So again, it, it's helpful from a standpoint of further uh, benefits of less cleaning uh, and so forth. And then we improve the efficiency when we're not doing the cleaning and hold times on equipment in rooms. So really we refer to this hierarchy of controls and using a flexible isolator as an engineering control, which really when we look at uh, the top two parts of the hierarchy, elimination and substitution, uh, it, it's very difficult to uh, replace the hazard, if you will, because the hazard, uh, the compounds that we're handling are the risk. And so uh, looking at an engineering control and being able to apply that across the, the industry is, is key to the, to the benefits of flexible technology. So looking at that and how do we apply flexible isolators is always a question. And so we're looking at a case study here very quickly. Uh, on the left, we're showing a picture of a roller compactor. And this is uh, a, a capital uh, purchase uh, process here where the, the new equipment, uh, the roller compactor is being purchased, but it can be prepared ahead of time for the application of a flexible isolator. So in this case, it's a simple mounting flange that uh, is, is provided by the original equipment manufacturer. And the picture on the right shows the flexible isolator attached to that mounting flange. Uh, of course, there would be a frame that would then further uh, support the isolator to allow uh, the operator to easily move about and so forth. So in some cases, the, the flexible isolator technology is prepared with the original equipment, but for the most part, we're looking at the retrofit of existing equipment with containment. And so here, it, it, the number one key is to adapt the containment to the equipment and, and not to have a lot of uh, modifications of the equipment that require requalification, which adds to the cost of the project in, in, in a retrofit type of situation. As always, we're going to focus on ergonomics, so the operators continue to perform the SOPs with, with little change. Again, this goes to uh, requalification and performance of the system. We want to make as few changes as possible to operating procedures uh, so that operators uh, can continue to you to perform the, the processes as they always have uh, with the flexible isolator attached. Moving on, uh, we'll take a look at material construction and some of the design and manufacturing considerations. So here at ILC Dover, uh, we provide all of our flexible isolators with ArmorFlex. It's a trademark of ILC Dover. Uh, the key uh, to the material is strength and integrity. Uh, the common question about flexible isolators is, will it fail? How will it fail? And, and really, when we're dealing with high potent products, it cannot fail. So the Armor Flex was a purpose-built uh, film for pharmaceutical powder processing. And when it was developed, uh, looking at the available materials, uh, we used a blend of low-density polyethylene with a higher blend or a higher strength material, linear low-density polyethylene. So the linear low was, was a development that was done by the Union Carbide Corporation to recognize the, uh, the need for a higher strength material. And so we applied that technology to our flexible isolator film, the Armor Flex. This is not a commodity film. Uh, and, and this is a film that, again, is purpose-built uh, and 
developed by ILC Dover to apply into this, this industry. So it, it's not available on the open market and really dedicated to the use of uh, ILC Dover for these flexible isolators. Further than just the strength, there are other physical properties that a material should have for use in a flexible isolator. Uh, obviously, in the pharmaceutical industry, we must use virgin materials. We talked about the high strength and really that, uh, that, that ability to resist tears and so forth. Resistant to solvents, the pharmaceutical industry is, is always uh, dealing with a variety of solvents. Uh, static dissipative, because as we're working with solvents, we wanna make sure that we're not building up a static charge that could uh, to release a, a charge. Uh, and with that, the, uh, some, some further standards uh, to achieve that static dissipative uh, quality, the Chilworth incendivity test and compliance to the ATEX standards for, for Europe and other parts of the world. In a flexible isolator, uh, one of the keys is for it to be transparent and lightweight. Uh, the operators when using the isolator need to be able to interface with the equipment and components inside the isolator. And so being transparent is very key. And there's other benefits that, that can be one with the flexible isolator. It can create a barrier for oxygen uh, control to have a low O2 uh, by a range of things, perhaps uh, desiccation or uh, nitrogen inerting, uh, which also can lead to a control of relative humidity. And lastly, this is a polyethylene material. so. Uh, when it comes to finally uh, destroying the material, for the most part, it's incinerated and it's a material that's considered to be safe to incinerate. So going through sort of the design process and how does that work? Um, and there's so many different applications in the pharmaceutical market that looking at each application sort of independently is, is important. Uh, here, we're showing a design iteration process for a tablet press, a Korsh 100 uh, tablet press. And, and really, it's key as we develop this for what needs the customer has uh, for their application. Uh, one company may have a different requirement for their Korsh XL than another company. So really, we, we first have to determine the area that will be in the containment zone. What are we going to contain? And the key now is to minimize uh, the areas that do not need to be in the containment zone. So as you can see in this uh, design graphic that we're keeping the technical cabinet below the, uh, the, the, the tablet press, uh, we're keeping that technical cabinet out of the containment zone. We need to understand the material flow to integrate the transfer systems. Obviously, we'll need to get material in, let's say a granulated material to come into the hopper we'll need to take tablets off. In, in this case, you can see the final design to the far right that we also have a transfer coming out for another tablet uh, inspection process. So we, we need to understand what has to transfer through the system, what's coming in, what's coming out. We always apply standardized components for the best cost and delivery. So you'll see that in a lot of cases, some of the design is driven by a standard component that we can use and is readily available uh, for, for a quick delivery and to keep it the best value. Uh, we always evaluate the ergonomics for single or multiple operators. Uh, in some uh, of the applications we'll look at, you'll see that multiple operators might interface with the isolator at a time. Sometimes it just could be a single operator. So we need to take a look at that and make sure that we create the ergonomics for the SOPs that will be done. And lastly, there always has to be a plan for cleaning and the removal process. Uh, the design of, a, of an isolator and the design of a flexible isolator should consider the entire process through cleaning, removal, um, and disposal of the flexible isolator. So here um, is the design realization of that iterative uh, Korsh XL100 design. So you can see uh, through the design process, this, uh, this picture of the installation looks very similar to what was developed in the 3D drawings and so forth. So uh, another key with flexible isolators is to understand that there can be a continuous improvement process in which operators, when getting a chance to work with these isolators, can find where there need to be improvements. Uh, perhaps there's a change in the process. 
which is, is quite simple to uh, do a redesign on the consumable part, the flexible isolator part. As you can see, the framework that's used is, is a skeleton type of framework. It, it doesn't really infringe uh, much on the process. And so we can make changes and additions very easily and very quickly, again, very economically uh, when needed. And this is very key as, as operators begin to interface and, and find ways to improve the process and make the suggestions on how to do that. So uh, the design realization can go on for continuous improvement as more input is uh, allowed for the design. And now uh, into a little bit of the manufacturing process. So uh, with flexible isolators, again, with the idea that it cannot fail, uh, we're not only talking about the film, but we're talking about the entire assembly of the flexible isolators. So flexible isolators are made from piece parts. Uh, that makes sense because they're uh, different shapes and sizes, uh, uh, different gloves uh, positioned around the, the isolator and so forth. So all of this starts in, in a range of pieces. Uh, now the pieces are made with automatic cutting. So uh, the cutting table can produce and duplicate the pieces time after time after time for, uh, for that same part, uh, which is really key to make sure that the assembly is always the same. And when the flexible isolator is installed that the operators can interface with it always the same. Just as the uh, cutting is done automatically, the welding is also an automatic process with CNC controls. As you can imagine, uh, welding a film uh, component together is key to always have the same temperatures, the same amount of time and so forth. So this is all done through CNC controlled uh, systems. And the whole concept here is to develop processes that are repeatable and traceable within the quality program. This is uh, leads to being able to have a high level of confidence that the process is duplicated time and time again. And lastly, in the picture on the right, uh, the inflation dwell test is the final study to assure that the film and the integrity of the assembly has been done uh, where there won't be any leakage or any ability for uh, the uh, material that's being contained, the potent compound, for escaping. So uh, a, an inflation dwell test for every uh, containment product is done to assure that level of integrity. So a little bit on that technique to, uh, to speak to integrity, and again, under the idea that it cannot fail, is looking at a unique process that's provided by ILC Dover when using this ArmorFlex material. So this is lap seam welding. Uh, we often hear from customers that are looking to adapt uh, flexible technology and flexible isolators at, for the first time uh, to talk about, well, where can it fail? Uh, the weld seams probably are the weakest uh, point of the assembly. Well, well, really using lap seam technology, and you can see that in the picture of the isolator that across the front is a stripe that looks a little bit uh, less transparent than the rest of the isolator. In that case, that is the lap seam weld, and it's positioned in an area where it's not going to interfere with the operator's performance and being able to see through uh, the isolator. So. The lap seam weld is, is, is merely taking one inch of the material and overlapping it and, and doing the weld process there compared to a lot of uh, isolators use the pinch seam weld uh, uh, technology. So that has some risk because it does become the weakest point of the assembly versus the uh, lap seam weld is the strongest point of the assembly. Just another technique there to uh, provide a highly uh, a product with high integrity and assuring the uh, uh, possibility of failure is, is minimized. Okay, so now we'll look at some of the applications and pharmaceutical processes that have been realized with flexible isolator technology. Uh, we're going to go through a range of examples and, and the examples are, are presented to give an idea of how the products can be applied, how the isolators can be applied and attached to a whole range of, of, of these processes. So here we're going to look at uh, weighing subdividing of chemicals, let's say non-potent materials where uh, flexible isolator technology could have a benefit. We'll also look at some chemical synthesis process, then back to weighing and subdividing, but this time talk about the drug substance 
and then excipients. And, and really the drug substance is, is the key here when we're dealing with uh, 100% of the API. Then a, a, a few oral so, solid dosage processes, sampling, and, and then a unique uh, uh, packaging example uh, to take uh, the process of using flexible isolators uh, from the beginning to the end of the pharmaceutical value chain. So here in subdividing chemicals, even when they're non-potent, there can be a lot of benefits in doing that using flexible technology and flexible isolators. You see on the picture on the left, uh, drums are being transferred into FIBCs to minimize the number of drums that may be taken into the process area. So this is done in a uh, separate from the process area to keep uh, to assure that there's no cross-contamination when handling the drums. And typically when drums are used um, in the pharmaceutical process, let's say for reactor charging in, uh, in a non-potent process, you're using open manway charging by transferring that through a flexible isolator into an FIBC, like the Dover pack shown here. Uh, you're, you're now able to do a closed reactor charge um, and, and very effectively, so without risk of contamination or, or cross-contamination. So here, the flexible isolator, in this case known as a drum transfer system, allows a drum after drum after drum to be discharged into the FIBC in a highly contained way. Um, so even, even as a non-potent, this is a, a value to uh, reduce the, the reliance of handling drums, particularly in a process area. On the right is a little bit more of a sophisticated flexible isolator, and this is mounted above a reactor to charge uh, paper sacks of chemicals. Again, the, the paper sacks uh, um, are loaded in the left-hand part of the isolator, and in this case, a very unique design of 24 paper sacks are loaded into uh, the ante area, um, and then those are transferred to the right where they are open and uh, put through put into the uh, the reactor nozzle. Uh, really unique here because uh, how do you handle uh, sacks of, of uh, chemicals? Uh, these are, are typically pretty heavy, uh, often uh, 30 pounds or more. Uh, so in the left hand side, using the flexibility of, of an isolator of a film isolator, uh, there's a lift system that brings the paper sacks up to the working level for the isolator on the right. So very unique system in leveraging one more of the benefits of flexible technology and being able to uh, transport large amounts of product while uh, using special devices like lifts and so forth. We'll see that again in another example. So here we're looking at uh, uh, two milling operations, one in the pilot plant size and one in more of a production scale. So on the left, you can see an operator working very easily uh, through the gloves for a co-milling operation. So uh, very easy for uh, the operator to handle the materials to put into the feed hopper of the co-mill and, and pass through. The material is collected at the discharge. And then again, using a transfer system, the, uh, the milled materials are, are brought out of the isolator. Uh, more of a production scale on the right, you can see that there's actually two levels of, of gloves that are added to this isolator. Uh, again, the, the materials have to be charged uh, a little bit higher into the hopper and then processed through, but there it will be work that needs to be done sort of at that, that uh, lower level as well. So uh, the flexible isolator technology is adapted to the process as needed. And it, one of the key to, to continue to look at in all of the examples is the minimal, uh, uh, the minimal work that's done with the frame. The frame is there really to support the isolator um, and, and to assure that the access to the process is, uh, is quite simple for the operators and also thinking about continuous improvement and changes uh, in the future that by minimizing the frame size, uh, we also allow for uh, any type of revision to be done, gloves added in different positions and so forth, so very easily to continue to adopt to improve the process when using such a skeleton frame as used with uh, these flexible isolator systems. Another milling application, a really popular type of application in micronizing, and you can see the non-contained process on the left, 
which can be a little bit sophisticated when it comes to the feed hopper, how to get the materials into the feed hopper that then feed the micronizer, which go to the collection area. In this case, uh, it's a, a hard stainless steel type of uh, uh, bag house, if you will, that will allow the, the release of the powder from the gas and so forth. So we take the, the, the information and the dimensions for uh, the micronizer, and in the middle, we show a 3D uh, design concept of how that would work, where the gloves will be positioned, uh, assure that uh, all components can be reached for the process and for uh, the cleaning. And then on the right, again, a, a fairly sophisticated shape that is used then for the final product. And in this case, again, we're showing that the integrity test of an inflation dwell beginning to, uh, to assure that the assembly uh, and all of the film, the welds and so forth have, have met the criteria for 100% containment. Um, so again, when we take a look at this, uh, the design was created for feeding of the material into the hopper, uh, but from there, the system is really contained. Uh, but then we look at the whole process. So there is a sampling process where containment is broken. So the isolator is used for containment during that sampling process. And then certainly breakdown and cleaning uh, the isolator provides the high containment during those processes. But we know that we don't live in a perfect world and often there are upset conditions. Uh, we've seen with many customers in applying isolation technology to isolators, uh, to uh, micronizers, you realize that something could go wrong in the process and in the middle of a batch have to do a disassembly of the micronizer uh, for cleaning or clearing or something uh, to that effect using a flexible isolator, having that in place for those upset situations allows for high containment in the process to continue uh, without risking contamination, cross-contamination, or exposure to the operators or to the environment. So in some cases, looking at those upset situations that may not happen on every batch, but could happen and are very costly when containment is not available. So here we go to the weigh and dispense of a drug substance. So we treat this a little bit differently because as we look at a drug, drug substance, we, we have no blend of the excipient and so forth. So every particle that could be released uh, from the process uh, for into the environment or potential exposure to the operator has to be contained versus when we're working with a drug product that we have potentially a mixture of the API, the substance with excipients and so forth. So, you know, it's, it's really key here to make sure that we uh, have high containment when wearing, when uh, processing the drug substance. So this is very typical. Uh, often the flexible isolator will be used in these processes, providing less than 50 nanograms per cubic meter containment levels, a containment performance target. Um, so it's highly effective and, and proven. Uh, the photo on the left is showing uh, the high clarity that we get with a flexible isolator and here in a very accurate process uh, using a balance. Uh, the balance even has uh, a, a shroud on it to assure that it's not affected uh, by any uh, uh, air currents and so forth in the isolator. So it's a uh, highly precision process that needs accuracy all the way through and also that we're going to minimize uh, the waste that could be created, meaning that the operator needs high clarity, uh, good dexterity with the gloves to be able to do the process without losing any of that powder into the isolator onto uh, the isolator work surface, which could be considered waste material. So, so extremely important. Uh, the, the, the drawing on the right shows us a little bit of a unique thing, again, that can be done with flexible isolator technology. And you can see the drum is on a scissor lift, which can be lifted up into the isolator to make ergonomics for the operator much easier to be able to scoop the source powder from that drum and begin the weighing process. Again, another advantage of flexible technology that is not there for uh, some of the hard wall isolator designs that are, are, are also, also used. So we want to stress uh, not just that this is a process uh, or containment for, what, for wet granulation and so forth, but we want to stress that um, flexible isolator technology is used all the way through the life cycle of, of a uh, process, right from 
uh, research and development into pilot plant processing and into full production. So here were different examples of wet granulation uh, systems that allow that have been uh, highly contained using flexible isolators. Each are different, uh, but again, one of the keys is going back to we're adapting the isolator technology to the equipment with minimal modifications of the equipment, which require requalification and revalidation, and also uh, certainly adds to the cost of the project. So being able to go through all processes and being able to adapt this flexible isolator technology with minimal changes is, is, is a key. And we look at that here again with an encapsulation process of an Excelido 600 uh, encapsulator. Uh, this system was actually part of a containment performance test uh, that achieved less than 30 nanograms per cubic meter. A couple of uh, real interesting keys here. Uh, the first is, is we, we see that the, the, the design is to use an air sweep using a standard vacuum, uh, pharmaceutical uh, vacuum system, a, a NILFIS type of vacuum. And we're doing an air sweep. We're really not doing a negative pressure control because it's really just creating a, an air sweep through it. So we have uh, filters that are designed into the isolator to allow makeup air in and the NILFIS vacuum pulls through. So it's, it's, it's helping in the containment a little bit as Dave Howes will talk about a true negative pressure control will give more advantages, but there can be benefits here. Again, when we talk about the retrofit uh, of the design, We've kept the technical cabinet below the, um, the encapsulation area completely out of the, um, of the containment zone. So we've isolated technical components. So later when maintenance has to do repairs, uh, changes and so forth in that technical cabinet, uh, it's been completely isolated from the product. And so they don't have risk of exposure to, uh, to whatever has been processed in, in this uh, encapsulator machine. And a big key here is you can see that we've positioned gloves uh, around the entire perimeter of the encapsulator, which allows for the operations to be done in the most ergonomic positions by the operator. You also see that there's no additional lighting in a lot of uh, isolation technology using stainless steel uh, hardwall isolators. Uh, lighting has to be added in strategic places to be able to see. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stainless steel uh, on the sidewalls and so forth, which restrict uh, where gloves can be positioned to work with the equipment. So uh, again, a big key here is a flexible isolator with this skeleton type of frame uh, can, be, uh, can be used to assure the best positions to do all of the work around the process. And we bring up tablet encoding as a quick example. And, and here on the left, we've, we've got a small tablet press on the right, um, a, uh, an OHAR, OHAR coder, uh, tablet coder. Uh, and, and really, we're looking at containing the process. So that's what we're showing in, in these two photos of, uh, of, of the tableting and coding process, but really also containing the transfer. So with the uh, flexible isolator technology, there has to be the built-in ability to move the materials from one process to the next step. Uh, the flexible technology that's typically used in, in the ILC Dover systems, you know, the bag in bag out system, uh, but we can also apply everything from split butterfly va valves to uh, rapid transfer ports and other technology to make that transfer. So it's, it's not only key to contain the process, but we need to think about, well, where, what is the next step? Where is the product coming from? Where is the product going to? so that we can arrange the transfers in a way that's also high containment and ergonomic. Thought to show a, a unique uh, design here for a packaging line. So this is a bottle filler. So putting tablets into bottles, applying the lids and torquing those lids to, to tighten them. And there also could be a label application as well. So here, when the risk assessment was done, it was found that uh, the risk uh, of exposure was very low. We've got the, the product in a tablet form. Uh, it's going into a bottle and then going to be closed. So there is low risk of exposure to the operators or to the room, but there still is a risk. And, and that's what the takeaway from the risk assessment was. Um, and, and then it was evaluated of, well, what happens in an upset condition? Bottles fall over. How do operators have to uh, 
interact with the system. And so you can see here, uh, every position where an operator might have to interact with it, uh, we, we put gloves. So it's a, it's a, a bit of a sophisticated system, but um, this, is, this is a system that can be reused. Again, we've got product that is a final product. It is on a packaging line, so it's gonna be the same product from batch to batch to batch. And so in the risk assessment it was found that the isolator could be in, put into position and run for a very long period of time before uh, removal and disposal. So uh, going through that to look at the technical solution and then also to look at the economic solution resulted in this type of design for a packaging line. So we wanted to, to present uh, that there, there's always unique processes there and there will always continue to be unique processes and needs. So you can see the, uh, the picture of this flexible isolator is, is quite unique, both in its shape and its size. Um, so this was useful in uh, prototyping a new dr uh, drug delivery concept and going through the entire uh, development of that process to understand uh, what was happening in the process to be able to physically be able to see into uh, the system where uh, the alternative would have been a large stainless steel vessel, making it very difficult to really interact and understand what was going on with the process as well as, as it would have been extremely difficult. In this case, the, uh, the drug development uh, went, uh, went through and, and the drug has gone onto the market um, and they decided to adapt this technology for the production side of it as well. So it was really meant to just start as prototyping as a way to have a, a fairly low cost way to do all the prototyping, do all the design considerations, and then move to, let's say, a permanent uh, hard wall type of solution. But the economics were evaluated and so uh, stayed with the, uh, the flexible isolator technology and the consumable. Now, these systems can be integrated with, uh, with hardware. Uh, in this uh, type of system, a unique uh, hopper-shaped uh, discharge was created that also allowed for uh, some vibration to move the particles towards the, uh, the discharge. So a unique interface of the flexible isolator with a, with a hardware component to make a complete design. So here's where I'll hand it off to uh, Dave Howes, and Dave will uh, take the presentation forward uh, with the benefits of the negative pressure control system. Thank you, Scott. Can you, uh, thank you. I want to take some time now to talk briefly about the benefits of negative pressure control for your flexible isolator. The picture, the picture presently on the screen is an example of such a flexible isolator system consisting of two key components, flexible isolator shown in part on the left and a device that generates and controls the vacuum inside the flexible isolator. In this instance, the picture shows the ILC Dover Armaflex atmospheric control module. So what are the benefits? Next slide, please, Scott. The first and most fundamental benefit is additional risk mitigation. Put simply, if you keep the process operational space in which your hazardous powder is present at a pressure below that of where the operator is located, any flaw in the containment barrier will result in airflow and hence hazardous powder away from the operator. This makes the operation fundamentally safer. Secondly, a correctly designed system will provide automatic breach response. This means that any breach in the containment barrier will be immediately detected by the atmospheric control module or equivalent device, immediately initiating a series of response actions, namely ramping up fan speed to maintain vacuum levels within the isolator and issuing alarms to alert operators. Next slide, please, Scott. The third benefit is not necessarily so self-evident. This is enhanced containment performance. Every isolator, be it of hard wall or, or flexible design, has weak spots with respect to maintaining the containment barrier. And this is any device or arrangement 
that passes material through this barrier. Examples include split butterfly valves, rapid transfer ports, and bag in, bag out sleeves. With a correctly designed isolator, the location of gas inlets and outlets creates unidirectional gas flow within the isolator volume. This flow always being away from the so-called weak spots. The fourth benefit is more an important conditioning of the negative pressure operation. An excessive pressure differential across the flexible film barrier can cause this film to become rigid, thus losing its intrinsic flexibility and resultant ergonomics. ILC Dover recommends and ensures with their own device, the Armaflex Atmospheric Control Module, a vacuum within the isolator of minus 15 pascals, this being a sufficient differential to deliver the aforementioned risk mitigation benefits while not undermining the ergonomic performance of the flexible isolator. Slide please, Scott. To fully highlight the benefits of a negative pressure isolator system, and how these are both achieved and maintained, I will take the next few slides to explain how the key components are designed and installed. Next slide, please, Scott. Obviously, the first key component is the flexible isolator itself. Without being connected to a vacuum generating device, this isolator can still provide excellent containment performance in a mode we refer to as static. Next slide. The addition of the next component, such as the Armaflex atmospheric control module, changes this to a dynamic isolator system. We offer pre-engineered, fully automated system that is truly plug and play thus focusing attention of the operators on the key element of the system, that being the flexible isolator. Next slide. Step one in the installation is connection of electrical power supply to the atmospheric control module cabinet, inside which is the fan that will generate the vacuum for the isolator. Next is the connection of a gas supply this can be compressed air, although nitrogen is frequently used, so the atmosphere inside the isolator can be fully inerted. Next slide. There are three connections between the atmospheric control module and the flexible isolator. The first being the gas feed, the regulation of which is completed inside the atmospheric control module cabinet. Next slide. The second connection is the differential pressure sensor inside the atmospheric control module cabinet. This and the pre previous gas feed connection are made using plastic tubing with a push fit connector. Next slide. An important design detail to highlight is the provision of a HEPA filter at the connection point of the aforementioned tubing to the isolator. This permits the removal of this tubing at any time without loss of containment. Next slide. An H14 HEPA filter in a stainless steel housing is attached to the isolator, being supported by the isolator frame. The location of this gas outlet filter with respect to the gas feed inlet is an extremely important design detail, one not addressed here in this simplified schematic. Remember, containment performance is enhanced by unidirectional gas flow away from any transfer device through the containment barrier. Next slide. The HEPA filter is then connected using a gas hose to the atmospheric control module cabinet where it will be attached to the fan inlet. Note this hose can also be removed safely without loss of containment since it is downstream of the HEPA filter. Next slide. Finally, 
The gas is vented from the atmospheric control module cabinet. This is another important detail with respect to just how vent gas is to be managed and IRC Dover can assist you with this. Next slide. This slide schematically portrays the complete flexible isolator system. Under steady state conditions, there will be a constant flow of gas into the isolator with the same volume being extracted via the HEPA filter. The gas flow through the isolator will be optimally configured by the design of the isolator itself. Focusing on the isolator design is always the critical path or critical point of any project. Scott, I hand it back to you now. Well, thank, thank you, Dave. That was very interesting. And the simplicity of the atmospheric control module and the plug and play method. We'll move on to the risk assessment and performance data that would apply both to the static isolators and that negative pressure isolator that Dave just presented. So we see on the right the typical uh, ICHQ9 quality risk management system uh, that's applied when evaluating what is needed in terms of a containment project. So the risk assessment is to evaluate the risk and to select the containment system needed. This is very important to not underdesign or overdesign a system, uh, risking capital as well as needed floor space. So the risk assessment can provide us direction on which containment system to purchase. Again, different product forms and processes will change the level of risk, uh, even with the same hazard or the same compound. We'll see that in the case study next. And Within the industry, there is a developing standardized approach that's very useful to determine with different hazards and different processes uh, what the risk could be. And so these standardized approaches, as seen in this example, are then applied to determine the containment system selected for the process. So we'll run through a quick case study here and show data on the performance of the flexible isolator systems. So here in the first is to take a look at a dispensing and sieving process. So here, not only are we doing a dispensing process, but the, uh, the drug substance in this case, uh, so 100% API, is being sieved. And as we go through a typical process, we're doing area sampling, and then we're doing operator breathing zone samples, which are at the bottom of the data table. You can see on the final right-hand column that we've calculated the geometric mean of three standard test runs for doing the surrogate testing. Here, the surrogate that was used was a naproxen sodium. Um, and so here we can see that we're less than seven nanograms per cubic meter when using the flexible isolator system. And in this case, this was a static pressure system. Again, the information as Dave presented the negative pressure system can improve that performance and also uh, help us in upset or breach conditions. In the, in the second part of the study, we looked at the roller compactor uh, containment. So again, we did the same type of studies with the material, but again, the material was changed and now we have an excipient with the API. Now here we look at the roller compactor process is a li little bit more complicated than weigh and dispense. And so our numbers are a little bit higher, which makes total sense. We're still dealing with the same hazard, but the process has changed. So we have to be very cognizant of that when understanding the containment. But even with that, the containment levels are still below 20 nanograms per cubic meter in the roller compactor process. Moving downstream a little bit further, we're looking at the encapsulator in, in the application of the flexible isolator. Now here in the encapsulation process, we're dealing with a material that's very granular. Uh, not much powder, should be very little dust to it. And so now again, even though our hazard is the same as we were dealing with the roller compactor, the form of that hazard is different. It's less likely to uh, be dusty, less likely for small particulates to get airborne. And so we see our best results with uh, certainly the background at the top was uh, a bit bit higher at seven nanograms, 
but we're looking at about 2.25 nanograms per cubic meter, which completely makes sense. So when looking at a risk assessment, we not only look at just what the hazard is, but we look at other components of that, of what is the process, what is the mass flow, uh, things like that to determine the right application of the containment system. So now we'll just take a brief look at the cost benefits in uh, the time for project management in doing an isolation process uh, project and looking at a comparison of a uh, flexible isolator system to a hard wall system. So here we, we, we find that more and more companies are looking at containment to be evaluated as a business case to have an ROI. I've heard it said in many, uh, many presentations that containment is a cost and the more containment you need is a greater cost. Well, that may not be necessarily true. And this, there is a tool that's become popular, the Rossi tool, which was actually developed circa 1995 by 15 of uh, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, Roshi, Return on Health, Safety and Environmental Invest Investment, was developed as a way to look at uh, safety and environmental costs in a way to what is to lead to a return on investment. Very, very interesting analysis and has been applied by several companies in evaluating containment projects. And really, it's taking a look at the strategic analysis for the containment. And these are real costs that can be calculated, uh, reduced cleaning and validation, uh, less PPE and gowning costs, reduce materials, less maintenance, eliminate product loss and efficacy issues, uh, reduced utilities, water, fixed floor space, a whole range of things, all leading to a lower CapEx to begin with, and, and obviously then leading to a faster return on investment. So there are tools to quantify what the value of the containment system can be. And then there's the tactical analysis. And so in the, uh, in the, in the ROSI information, we look at the tactical analysis and consider the possibilities of what happens when, let's say, containment is not being used. What, what does a contamination cost? What does an exposure injury cost? Uh, again, in, in not using containment, not using the right containment, what happens if uh, that leads to an audit or uh, potentially even a 483 and what does that cost? And certainly in the big picture, what does a recall cost? And we know that there have been uh, many instances, instances of contamination that could have been prevented by using containment. So again, it's a, it's a matter of an analysis here in using an ROI tool to look to say containment may be a value and have a return on the investment and also then from a tactical standpoint, avoid these uh, unwanted conditions. So a uh, direct analysis here of a hard wall isolator and the flexible wall isolator. So these, uh, these two units are identical. Uh, the flexible isolator was deployed as a way to assure that the engineering and validation batches would be made on time. And the perception was the hard wall system shown on the left uh, was therefore the, for permanent in processing of the drug substances as, as, as required. Um, but we have a dramatic difference in cost and a dramatic difference in how the project could be implemented. So we, we know that the typical current day cost of the isolator, uh, the hard wall isolator is as high as $775,000 and the project could take up to 28 weeks. Uh, the reality is that the flexible isolator, which was proven to have uh, to meet the containment performance target, uh, had a capital expense and current day value of about 70,000 US. And it was a static pressure isolator, which was there to facilitate the delivery and that delivery at the time was, was eight weeks. Um, but here we look at it and say, well, let's compare apples to apples. Let's make sure we're, we're, we're doing that. So we could add the negative pressure kit, the, the ArmorFlex atmosphere control module as Dave Howes presented uh, for uh, roughly $55,000. So again, when we take a look at the cost comparison uh, to the hardwall isolator, we have a dramatic savings uh, when apl applying the uh, flexible isolator technology, and then we have the project time. And so the typical project time in the apples to apples comparison, uh, flexible isolator, 12 to 14 weeks, and the hardwall isolator up to 28 weeks. 
And then we have more benefits as shown in, in this project. So this was actually a project that was completed by a multinational pharmaceutical company. And the, the actual isolator as shown on the top left in the picture uh, in their, their operating or in their, their processing suite. Uh, but we have the comments uh, from the right. And here, it was interesting of what happened is as the project started off, and this was a plant expansion, um, that they, they found they needed to change the purpose. So they repurposed the use of the flexible isolator before it was even uh, started, really. Uh, after the design approvals were put in place, it was decided to change from dispensing a uh, powder in a high containment process to dispense for manually packaging for, for a stability process. So this was presented by the industrial hygiene people of this multinational company, and they found that the project came on time for delivery. It stayed within budget, and as noted in the, uh, in the details below, the containment performance target was needed. A side comment was made in the presentation that the industrial hygiene person was able to easily move this isolator uh, when needed from the storage area to the process area uh, by that one person, which is not really possible when we're talking about hard wall isolator systems that are very bulky, uh, very heavy, difficult to move around. So a lot of small benefits that all add up together when evaluating the benefits of the, a flexible isolator system. So that's our presentation today. We thank you very much for attending. Uh, this is part of the webinar series or virtual trade show experience that ILC Dover is presenting to our customers. We hope you visit the future webinars that we'll be having. And please, if you have a request or the need for more information, please contact our, our marketing department who will be sending everyone a link to this program after the webinar is complete. With that, I'll Throw it back to our host, Paolo. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, David, for explaining us this technology. So now it's time for some questions. So the first one is, how do you perceive the use of single-use technology in pharmaceuticals? And in which part of the process brings uh, a bigger benefit? Right, so we've applied single-use um, technology, both from single-use isolators to single-use FIBCs throughout the value chain in, in pharmaceutical processes, uh, starting with the chemical synthesis all the way through. So it's a hard question to answer, I think, to where does it bring most value? The value is, is something that, again, can be analyzed, uh, but we find when processes need to go through regular cleaning, a, a regular schedule of cleaning, and that could be driven by uh, a CMO that is running different products. Uh, it can be driven by a quality requirement. So anywhere where cleaning is a, a schedule uh, requirement, uh, we find the benefits are even increased more in, in that process. Thanks. The, the next one is, um... How can these solutions being installed in ATEX area or for other parts of the world in rated areas? Right, so particularly with the ATEX, um, the key to that is using a static dissipative film. Um, there is an idea that in an ATEX process, simply by inerting uh, the process area, that that's the way to achieve that ATEX rating. That is partially uh, successful in achieving the ATEX rating, but using a static dissipative film as required under the ATEX guidelines in which um, a, the, the amount of a non-static dissipative material is limited. So uh, the ArmorFlex material that we've been talking about has been tested by a third party to meet the IEC TR 679-32 requirement which means that it does qualify as a static dissipative material in ATEX. And then furthermore, we have the Chilworth Incendivity Test, which is a globally recognized test to prove static dissipation to make it safe in these uh, areas with uh, explosion-proof ratings or, or higher ratings for electrical requirements. 
So the, the next question is about uh, how complex is to upgrade, uh, upgrade an existing process. Uh, I would say maybe we can look to that from different, two different points of view. Uh, how is to complex to upgrade a uh, process and contain this process or even how complex and maybe the second part is for David and how complex is upgrade um, uh, an existing static isolator with the armor flex uh, atmospheric control module. Well, I'll take the first part and then uh, hand the second to Dave. Uh, with respect to the complexity of implementing a containment solution using flexible containment, it, it really, again, de depends on each process. So there can be fairly simplistic uh, processes uh, that the system can be applied with minimal changes to the equipment, to the process area, to the SOPs and so forth. So when we're looking at something as complicated as a fluid bed dryer and trying to achieve containment, a little bit more sophisticated, takes uh, more detail and more time. But then when we're looking at uh, containing something as simplistic as a co-mill, it's relatively straightforward and so forth. So uh, again, at the end of the day, the goal of uh, flexible isolator technology is to minimize the impact on the process equipment to minimize the modifications that might have to be done that would drive a requalification and revalidation so that we eliminate that from the project in terms of time and cost. But then I'll give it to Dave to talk about the negative pressure system. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, upgrading an existing flexible isolator to become a negative pressure system is really, really easy. Um, that because uh, we've talked Scott talked at length about the manufacturing techniques for the flexible isolator the isolator itself uh, will need some adaptation some changes uh, there are three connections as I highlighted previously between the isolator and the atmospheric control module once those changes to the isolator are made the complete system can be set up it's that easy um, we discuss a location for the atmospheric control module does it need to be in any electrically classified area? We have a solution for that. You make your connections with your new isolator and device, away you go. Exceedingly simple to upgrade existing units. Okay, thanks. So uh, we are really running uh, out, uh, out of time. So, and we have a couple of questions to answer, uh, but uh, we will have a big pleasure to send you um, a written answer by, by email shortly. Um, so today we have seen that flexible isolators are robust and suitable for being used in multiple applications and for long-term campaigns. Uh, the association of the base material of the armor flex to a strong manufacturing and quality control program makes the ILC Dover flexible isolators unique in terms of reliability and robustness. Uh, flexible isolators can be used to easily upgrade existing processes, as we were just discussing, uh, when we need to produce a new potent drug or just to comply with industry guidelines. Uh, and typically, if we go back to the Scott's presentation and look into the hierarchy of controls, uh, where the law states it is very, very clear and states that respirators are not allowed as primary barrier. Uh, but this technology became a standard uh, from another point of view and facilitator in brand new applications, saving costs, time, making easier and faster the scale up process. And this new generation of the flexible dynamic isolators with the unique Arbor Flex atmospheric control module can provide an easy control of the environment inside the enclosure and automatically control parameters such as re relative humidity, inertia, or in the uh, other end, mitigates the risk when we have a special event, for example, a globe fail, or in a specific application where we can have some powders getting aerosolized and escaping through the transfer ports or seals. Uh, Again, I would like to emphasize the containment is a very, very complex job and is very, very risky and require uh, a lot of data and being very, very scientific to avoid errors, which would have a huge cost and impact in the people involved. Remember, the naked eye can perceive 
these exposure levels that we are uh, talking. Um, it brings to us as a group, as a suppliers or oper operational teams, EHS, engineering, manufacturing or the quality groups, to provide protection to ourselves, but especially to our colleagues that have no idea of the risk to what are they exposed every day and are bravely going uh, to their workplace producing medicines to save other lives. So I would like to finalize uh, by saying a big thank you for joining us in this webinar. It was a big pleasure for Scott, Dave uh, and I to share with the, all of you this presentation. And if you may have uh, any further questions, comments, or just want to share some uh, of your experience, please uh, feel free to contact us through your regional sales manager or by using uh, our webpage www.ilcdover.com. Thanks again and have a great day or evening. Goodbye.